Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for our second advanced program webinar of the year. My name is Katie Briggs and I'm your webinar host. This webinar is part two of a seven part series taking place this year. Our series highlights topics you've shared with us and is directly tied to our fifth anniversary's mission to continue empowering public media. We are grateful to our uh, series lead sponsor, CARS, and be sure to go to our website, publicmediawomenandleadership.org after today's webinar to view this year's webinar schedule. During today's session, we'll allow for audience questions. So be sure to use the Q&A function within the webinar platform to ask a question to our panelists, and we'll do our best to get to everybody's questions today. So now for the main event. Today, our panel will share their candid stories, strategies, and tactics to help you learn how to deal with sexist microaggressions. I'm happy to welcome our expert and moderator, Christine Page Deers, business manager at Public Media Journalists Association and certified workplace integrity trainer at PowerShift Project. Christine, take it away. Thanks so much, Katie. I appreciate it. Um, as Katie said, I am Christine Page Deers. I work for Public Media Journalists Association. I won't give you my resume because it's sort of long and involved. I'll just tell you one quick fact about my past work history. I spent eight years as the director of a motorcycle museum in Sturgis, South Dakota, where the big motorcycle rally is every year. So that's my fun fact about myself. Uh, we're just going to jump right into dealing with sexist microaggressions, and we're going to start today with a couple of definitions. The first one from Miriam Webster is a comment or action that subtly and often unconsciously or unintentionally expresses a prejudiced attitude toward a member of a marginalized group, such as a racial minority. Obviously, today we're talking a little bit more about sexist microaggressions, but microaggressions can be directed at any marginalized group. Second definition comes from Daryl Sue. Daryl Sue is an, an expert in microaggressions from Columbia University. Uh, his definition is brief and commonplace daily verbal, behavioral, or environmental indignities, whether intentional or unintentional, that communicate hostile, derogatory, or negative racial slights and insults toward people of color. Again, we're gonna talk more about sexist microaggressions today, but these are a couple of definitions just so that we're all on the same page. One of the problems when you're talking about microaggressions is that it makes them sound small. When we think about aggression, this is what we may think about is something that is mean and intentional and fairly large. But microaggressions are small. Um, they may look more like this and imagine that if you get poked by one of these pins one day, it's not that big a deal. But if you continually get poked by these pins over and over again, it becomes extremely uncomfortable. And that's what microaggression can look like. So back to that original definition from Miriam Webster, a comment or action that subtly and often unconsciously or unintentionally expresses a prejudiced attitude. So keep in mind that often microaggressions are very subtle and frequently the perpetrator doesn't even know that he or she is doing it. And make no mistake, we're all guilty at some point of microaggressions at one time or another. Even the best intentioned of us have done something or said something that has made another person feel devalued. Um, so, and often it's unconscious. We don't even realize that we're doing it. So here are some examples of what microaggressions are. Using loaded, dated, or demeaning language. Example, sports metaphors, war metaphors, maybe calling someone little lady. Those are all sort of dated um, and demeaning language. Offering condescending praise. So you're really good at that for someone who's so young or for a woman. Um, so it's praise, but it's condescending. Relegating a team's social note-taking or housekeeping tasks by gender. You've all seen it, you're in a meeting and someone needs to take notes and pretty much everyone around the table looks at the women in the room to say that they should be the ones taking notes. And often, if women complain about that, they are seen as not being team players. Focusing on looks before skill or talent. An example of this is you're watching a panel discussion at a conference and whoever the moderator is introduces man number one and here's his expertise and here's what he's done in his life and man number two and here's his expertise and what he's done. And now for the loveliest member of our panel, which is the only woman on the panel, um, that it's sort of, you know, 
diminishes that woman's skill and, and talent and, and talks more about her looks. Interrupting, ignoring, or talking over others. This is very common in meetings. Um, frequently, it is younger people who are cut off. Frequently, it is women who are cut off um, by interrupters. And frankly, probably many of us have done this in as well. You know, I tend to interrupt sometimes. It's something I've been working on personally. Um, I try not to ignore people. I try not to talk over other people. But sometimes I catch myself interrupting. So again, these microaggressions are not something that you do necessarily intentionally or mean-spiritedly. Assuming a person lacks or has certain interests, skills, knowledge, ability, or disability. One example of this, if you are very, very tall, I'm sure that you played basketball in high school, right? Assuming that someone has those abilities based on the way that they look or appear. Making statements or asking a question that presume the questioner is normal and the other person is unusual. So, for example, asking a person of color, where are you from? When this person is probably from the United States, has lived here all of his or her life, is a citizen, um, it, it gives the intention, it gives the impression, it implies that they don't belong in their own country. Asking highly personal questions related to gender identity, ethnicity, or disability. Uh, example of this would be asking an LGBTQ couple, which one of you is the guy? How about producing events or materials that exclude whole groups of people? Again, panels at conferences frequently, you will see all male panels. And in fact, some women have gone so far as to say that they will not participate on a panel unless there are other women on the panel. I think that can be kind of a catch-22 because if you are asked to speak on a panel and you are a, the only woman, by saying no, you may eliminate all women from the panel. But if you have enough power and you can elevate other people and ask for more, then great, go ahead and do that. Mimicking dialects or speech patterns and treating them as humorous. And you know, you may think that only people with um, accents that are up to your foreign may experience this, but frankly, I've experienced this as a person from the upper Midwest. And you know, sometimes I will say something and someone will make fun of the way that I speak. Repeatedly misidentifying colleagues or mispronouncing their names. Um, it's very important that we take the time to get to know people and that we remember who they are the next time that we see them. Um, again, I think most of us have probably experienced this at some point in our life where, you know, you'll meet someone, oh, it's great to meet you, and you think, I met you three times. <laughs> um, how about making physical contact out of curiosity or presumed consent? Um, the best example of this that I know of is if you have ever been pregnant, you have probably had someone walk up to you and touch your belly without your consent. Um, you also hear from women of color who say that people frequently will touch their hair without permission. Um, and so that, those are both great examples of, so, so all of these things are microaggressions. Now the question is, so what the heck do we do about them? Because Again, they're subtle and they're often unintentional and you may have seen yourself in one or two of these. So first of all, we can check our own behavior. That unconscious bias is an issue for everyone at some time or another. Don't kid yourself into thinking you don't have any unconscious bias, we all do. And believe it or not, women frequently have the same unconscious bias against women as men do. So you will catch yourself making these mistakes if you pay attention to your own behavior. Be a learner and a teacher. Admit when you've made a mistake and apologize for it and help others who, can, who are making uninformed comments. If you hear someone making a comment that might make someone uncomfortable, maybe you can point it out privately. Maybe it's a friend of yours and you can actually talk to them privately about it. If you see a subordinate doing this, maybe as a boss, you can speak to them. Uh, the next one is take a stand against aggression. Speak up for yourself if you can and if you're comfortable. And we know that sometimes that's not the case. Sometimes it's just easier to not bring these things up. 
But the more you can speak up for yourself, the more that you can teach other people about what these aggressions are and how they make you feel, the better off the entire workplace will be. And learn to have courageous conversations. Um, the Workplace Integrity Program that I'm a trainer for spends a whole module talking about courageous conversations, what they are. They are conversations that we don't often have at work, but that we should be having at work, um, and sort of bringing some of these things to the forefront. So, um, you, and we practice them. We actually practice them in the training. Um, we do role playing and practice. So we're going to go through a couple of case studies here. And before we do, I'm going to introduce the other panelists for this webinar um, because I would like them to participate in these case studies. So um, our panelists for today are Jeannie Yandel, who is a special projects editor at KUOW Public Radio in Seattle. Works on everything from podcasts to special broadcast series to live events. She's been a host, a reporter, and a producer, and she's won local and national awards for her reporting and interviewing. Recently, she created and co-hosted the podcast, Battle Tax Tactics for Your Sexist Workplace. She loses arguments every day with her seven-year-old daughter, <laughs> as any of us who've had a seven-year-old know is the case. <laughs> Um, and our other panelist is Phyllis Fletcher. Phyllis provides editorial guidance to APM podcasts. She is a frequent speaker, teacher, and coach. She was the inaugural editor of the year for what was then Prindy, what is now PMJA. And her first radio story was about racism that happens on the phone. So welcome to both of our panelists. We're very excited to have you both here. And I want you to help me with these two case studies. Great. Okay. For our first case study, you're in a brainstorming meeting with your colleagues. Ideas are flowing freely around the room. Sue raises an idea that you think warrants some attention. No one comments about her suggestion. And a few minutes later, Bob makes essentially the same suggestion as Sue made. Colleagues around the table get on board with the idea and start to build on it. So what do you do? Jeannie, you want to start? Sure. Um, oh, and before you start, let me say to the audience, um, if you have comments, please add them in the questions box. If you have ideas about how you would handle these case studies, please add them and Katie will share them with us. Go ahead, Jeannie. Thank you. Um, and I, just so everybody knows, I'm having seasonal allergies right now. There is a lot of pollen in the air in Seattle. I want to reiterate, I'm having seasonal allergies. So if I start coughing, that's what's going on there. Um, okay. So um, I think one thing you can do is once you're at the point where colleagues are building on somebody's idea and saying that it is uh, Bob's idea rather than Sue's, you have an opportunity to stop and say, hey, um, I just want to flag that this is something that Sue brought up several minutes ago, and I want to um, I want to repeat her original thinking about this idea since it is her idea, um, and I think it would be great if we did what Sue suggested, which is sort of iterate on the idea this way. I love that because, like, you just crammed in five times that it was Sue's idea, which is hysterical. Because uh, don't they say that people need the information seven times to absorb it or something? So, like. I think it's you may be like resetting for radio. Yeah, yeah, it's really good, but you did it all in like 20 seconds. Yeah, <laughs> I think that's great. And I think it's cool too, because if you're a, I mean, meetings can be intimidating, right? Like, let's also talk about the whole sexist framework of a meeting in the first place. Um, you know, it, it, it can, everyone's bringing their baggage into the room and their baggage is going to have sexism packed right in there. And so if you are a kind of person where doing Jeannie's example would um, you know feel like intimidating or something like that be be the first or if someone else is the first like just be the second person to just sl slip it in there because there's also power in numbers so if you don't feel comfortable um, you know being the alpha dog on that you can like be you know like hey this is it she said that right you know and yeah. someone else who heard the same thing will pile on so yeah. it can be mm -hmm. power in numbers Agreed. Also a reminder to watch for patterns. You know, this may be an isolated incident, but it may be that Bob frequently commandeers other people's ideas and that Sue is frequently ignored. And if that's the case, if you're the supervisor, then, you know, maybe it's time to address a little bit deeper some of those cultural things that are happening in the room. 
Um, but I think you're right. And I think it's a good idea too to say, you know, Sue, I think you said something just like this. Was Is this the same idea that Bob had? Do you want to sort of expand on what you were thinking? Mm -hmm. That's nice. Yeah, bring it back to her since she had yeah. the idea in the first place. That's awesome. Yeah. yeah. There could also be a cue for you as a supervisor or the person running the meeting that, you know, if you are noticing that pattern, perhaps that means you have to revisit how you're running your meetings. Maybe you have a meeting where it's not, it's not an opportune place for everybody to bring their best ideas forward and really build on something and make the best possible thing. One of the, like, one of the burdens of running meetings and being a supervisor in that way is figuring out what is actually the best way to sort of harness the collective genius of your team. And it's not always the meetings that you went to before you were a supervisor. It's not always a brainstorm session. Right. Right. And yeah, I also think that sure. you, know, you have to give credit to the fact that not everybody has the same conflict style. And, you know, Sue may not be the one to, you know, once she's put out her idea, it's like, okay, I'm done. You know, <laughs> she may just be the one to sit back and, you know, recognizing that she had the idea either in the meeting or outside of the meeting is helpful, I think. Mm -hmm. And to Tiff's question, it, it's, um, I, I feel like you do the same thing whether Bob is a manager or not. Bob, uh, Tiff asks if, if Bob is a manager who commandeers the comment, um, what do you do? I feel like you do a version of the same thing that you would do whether, whether Bob was the manager or not. Yeah. Right, right. Okay, well, well let's go on to the second case study that we have. <clears throat> So you're on the hiring committee for an opening at your organization. You've done your due diligence in hiring. You've asked each finalist the same questions, tried to be as fair as possible in your review of all of the candidates. During the discussion of who should be hired, one of your colleagues says they're concerned about one of the candidates because she seems too ambitious. How would you respond? Why? Well, let's start with you. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Yeah. I just like step back, step jump, jump straight in there. Why? I would ask why. Um, you know, because that's a that's an awesome thing we have at, at our disposal, um, you know, in a journalistic milieu, is to ask, you know, so yep. ask why, uh, and take it from there. That's how I would start that. I would yeah. be very knee-jerk with that, as you can tell. Why? <laughs> <laughs> I would, um, I mean, I'll probably say this a bunch, but I would, um, so I bet a lot of us are familiar with David Kandow and the training that he's done. Um, you know, that he did for a lot of us in public media. He always talked about um, the questions, the W5 and how questions you ask, and also the style in which you ask them, bland and color out. You can definitely ask W5 and how questions around somebody being too ambitious. Like, what do you mean by that? Like, how did you, how did you experience that? Um, why do you think ambition is a problem for this role? Um, you know, it can be tough to stay bland, but you know, I don't know. I have often been in situations where I have repeated bland and color out in my head <laughs> to see what they have to say. I forgot that one. That's a good one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and because that's good too, because you can get to it like, you know, I like that. How, how did you experience that? Or, you know, what made you think that? Um, and then also like kind of separating that from what makes that a bad thing. Right. Um, you know, I like that. I like both of those ideas because, yeah, I would really want to know, like, how did that show up for you? Like, what, mm -hmm. <laughs> like yeah. what, ex what really are we talking about here? Right. Because right. inherent yeah. in that comment is the assumption that everybody had the same impression of this person. And that's right. probably not accurate. No. True. Yeah. True. <laughs> well, yeah. And just a reminder about unconscious bias, it often causes the same action to be taken differently across different genders or ethnicities. <clears throat> um, frequently in women, ambition and assertiveness is seen as a bad trait and in men it's seen as a good trait so ch again check yourself yeah yourself and, and yes. make sure that you're not buying into those unconscious biases that that are very prevalent and again for all of us not just for men yeah what is Christina? the bland in oh thing oh sorry yeah yeah no 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 i was seeing the same question okay. um just that idea of bland in is like um, it's, it's not just the question you ask, but it's how you ask the question. And so like for interview training, it was like, you're trying to sort of keep, um, you're trying to keep um, a lot of inflection and emotion out of your voice because the goal is to make the person you're asking the question, they're supposed to be colorful. Um, right. You know, so what did you think about that? Rather than, what did you think about that? <laughs> Rather yeah, than, why? <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah. <laughs> so that's like, that's, that's the plan, good. right? Is, you know, trying to, it's not always easy to do that in these situations, but no. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Great. That's great. great. Well, that's our case studies. Now, I just want to quickly, before we get to the interview section, I do want to talk just a little bit about the PowerShift Project and PMJ's partnership with PowerShift Project. Um, I am a certified workplace integrity trainer, as we've said. Um, what that means is that myself or Terry Gilday, our executive director, can come to your organization for a fee to present a full day workshop on workplace integrity. Um, we've both been trained to do that. The other way that your organization can take advantage of workplace integrity, which, by the way, was designed by Jill Geisler, so, you know, fabulous training. Um, the there is a workplace integrity train the trainers program where someone from your organization can go for two days and learn to be a workplace integrity trainer and those workshops are actually free and travel stipend is provided due to a grant from P uh, cbs to the power shift project and one other quick plug the microaggressions information that we've talked about today again is much of it is from Jill um, and she has a webinar out called do you qualify as an ally which she's presented a number of times and you can find a recording of that particular webinar and lots of other resources at powershiftproject.org and so I would highly recommend checking those things out if you're interested so that's my plug and now I'm going to stop talking quite so much um, and I'm going to let uh, Phyllis and Jeannie talk some more. So um, let's hear from, from um, Jeannie, we'll start with you, um, and then we'll go to Phyllis. And the first thing I really want you to do is sort of tell us about an instance where you suffered or witnessed a microaggression. And then the second part of that question is, how did you deal with it then? Mm -hmm. And would you deal differently with it today than you did then? Ooh, okay. So, um... I, uh, <laughs> I, there, I, I actually had a hard time picking a story here. Um, but, um, the one that really stands out was, um, I had just come back to work, um, after having my daughter and I was sitting with my boss at the time who was a woman and she told me this story about, um, a previous workplace she was in and how a man accidentally walked in on another new mom while she was pumping. And uh, because, you know, there's, we could go down a whole wormhole about like spaces where <laughs> new moms can pump. But um, uh, the, um, the, the new mom got really upset about it. Um, and uh, so in the end, of the, the end of the story that my boss told me was essentially like, you know, she understood why the new mom got upset, but also the new mom went kind of crazy on this poor guy because, you know, hormones. Yeah. And so how did I deal with it at the time? I sat there dumbfounded because I didn't know what I was supposed to take from that story, why my boss was telling me that story weeks after I myself had returned from um, maternity leave and also, um, you know, faced the possibility of somebody telling me that I couldn't pump where I was designated to pump because it was also an electrical closet at the time. Um, so, uh, yeah, that's how I handled it. Um, and then I ruminated on it for seven and a half years. And then I told the story later in a webinar about sexist microaggressions. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so that's how I handled it. Um, so how would I handle it now? Um, I think that I would have, I'd like to think that I would have said something, but I probably would have waited a few months um, because, uh, you know, I, I wouldn't, I would have still felt on very um, rocky footing coming back to work as a new mom. Um, I would have felt under a lot of pressure to, as I did, you know, to prove that I could still do the job and that I was passionate enough and committed enough and all of these other things. Um, so, you know, I, um, I think, I like to think that I would have sat down with this boss who is no longer my boss and told her how that affected me. Um, you know, but even now I'm not sure. So mm -hmm. I think the, I, I, there's no way I would have said something in the moment. I, I just wouldn't have. I, I would have felt too insecure about my position to do it. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
Okay, great story. Phyllis, how about you? Yeah, and I want to I want to say that I really appreciate that point too that like you can't always say something right away. Yeah. And I feel like there's this you know, sometimes we put a lot of pressure on ourselves like uh, you know, I should have said something right away or I wish I had or you know. Yeah. Um and that is uh something that I always want to free people of. So and in including myself. Um so you know, thanks for sharing that, because um, I think that's right on. Um, so my story, it's like, it's, you know, the more that I was really sinking into Christine's definitions, I'm like, this is like kind of more macro. <laughs> so people are going to be like, how's that a microaggression? But I feel like it was, it's, it, the reason that I thought of it um, is that it was couched as a joke, which I think a lot of things like this can float around in. So this is from when um, I, I was a software engineer. And um, so that's a little bit of a different work culture. It can be very um, bro -y. It can be very like, come on, you know? And so, um, and this is funny too, because my son's going to overhear this. He's across the room. He's never heard this story before. <laughs> <laughs> Working from home. <laughs> so, um, so I've been like, I've had, I've had different weights throughout my life. I've been heavier and I've been lighter. And um, this was one of those in between times I thought. And um, that I was, I was going into the, the lunchroom and there was a very, very loud noise that came from somewhere outside. And this uh, colleague of mine at the time said, oh, I thought that was you sitting down in your chair. Yeah. Um, can oh you believe God. that? And so um, uh, how I handled it at the time, um, I would not do now because <laughs> what I did was a woman who was more senior to me and slightly heavier than me walked in the room and I said, say it again. And he turned, he went, boop, bright red, thank God. He did not say it again. Um, but he was scrambling and was like, why would you do that? What, what are you doing? And um, when I think about why I wouldn't do that now, of course, is I thought about her. She's someone I liked. And I almost dragged her into my BS with this guy because I was so pissed because I yeah. flashed and reacted, which yeah. is not the best thing always. So that kind of ties into why it's like, it's okay to react later. Yeah. Like I could have told him later he was out of order. Um, I had all the time in the world for that, but it's mm. like my lizard brain came out and went, wow. <laughs> and, and I said that. And it's like, it's only funny because he didn't actually repeat it. Um, mm. So I needed to not amplify his microaggression because I was hurt, you know? But that's what I, in the moment, like kind of tried to do. And that's yeah. whack. So I shouldn't have done that. This was a very long time ago, I would like to say. <laughs> how, would you, how would you deal with it today? If, if, if someone made that similar comment, how would you deal with it today? Yeah. I think that I would have done something like, bruh, seriously, and looked around at the other guys and waited for one of them to say anything. They probably wouldn't have. Mm. And then I probably would have told them later, like, dude, that was really messed up. I can't believe you did that. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. but I still like, you know, I definitely wouldn't have told the other woman. Yeah. You know, because um, that's, you know, it just, it could have made her feel bad. Right, right. So, you know, yeah. Yeah, that's my story. <laughs> <laughs> so, so talk a little bit about how we can be allies to other women who experience microaggressions. When we see something, how can we, you know, if it's not directed at us, because, because it really is two different things. One thing to be reactive when you're the one who's, who's having the microaggression against you. It's another thing. How can we be allies to other women? Mm. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, so, some of the things I have done is like when I saw something I didn't like, um, usually it's a one-on-one -on -one later, either with the person who did it um, or 
the person who I saw it happen to, depending on what kind of microaggression it is. But, you know, following up and being like, hey, I didn't like that, um, yeah. you know, and if it's the person who got the microaggression targeted at them saying like, how can I support you? I was thinking about doing this. Would you be comfortable with that? And then doing it if they say they're comfortable with it. So whether that means escalating or um, confronting the person or whatever. Um, and in a case where I have confronted the microaggressor who was doing that to somebody I just pulled them aside after meeting and said, you know, hey, I saw when you said, you know, and I was very specific. Um, I saw when you said X to this person that didn't seem like you what was going on mm. there, you know, um, and uh, and, you know, was able to have a really honest conversation after that. And I felt like it was good because they at least knew that I wasn't okay with that kind of stuff. So it's not like I was some superhero that stopped it forever, blah, but they just knew in the back of their mind or the front of their mind or whatever that like, hey, well, if I'm going to do X to this person, she's likely to say something afterwards. So, yeah. And I love the way you put that. I really do. I, that, you know, that didn't seem like you. I mean, it, it's, it, it takes some of the, some of the onus off of that person, mm -hmm. you know, you know, because frequently, you know, that they didn't mean anything, you know, yeah. frequently you'll hear something and know, Oh, you know, that person is so nice and so friendly and so gentle. And then you hear something and think, I can't believe you just said that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. And people are complex and usually whatever they're yeah. saying has to do with what's going on with them. It's right. almost, it's not really about the other person at all. Yeah. So the more you can focus it on like, what's going on with you, you know, um, is it, it can get you a lot farther, a lot faster. That's a really good point. Um, and I have to say, I love, I, I love how you're f also focusing on how comfortable the person who was micro aggress aggressed against, how comfortable they might feel with you taking action. Yeah. That's, you know, I, f I feel like I have, probably aired in the past by, you know, in like saying something without checking in with the person who was micro aggressed against in the first place. Like that's taking agency away. Like there are times when you have to make calculations about whether you're comfortable with this stuff getting called out or not. Mm -hmm. um, so I think, I think that's a really important point. Um, and I, I kind of wanted to talk about what happens when somebody's micro aggressed against, but they're not in the room. Um, you know, because this, this happens. I mean, I like, you know, as a, you know, as a white lady in her forties, I am in rooms that other people don't get into. Um, and people say stuff to me sometimes. Um, you know, I was in a hiring meeting once where somebody, we were talking about who we were going to hire and somebody said, talked about one of like our top candidate kept referring to this person as the diversity hire. Um, that's a problem. <laughs> um, exactly. Um, yeah. So, you know, in those moments, um, if you are in a room and somebody saying something about somebody else and that even if that person isn't in the room, um, that's, that's actually, uh, that's a good opportunity to use some of the, to use the question. Phyllis just suggested what's going on with you, um, you know, to ask more questions, um, you know, why do you keep, why do you keep referring to this candidate as a diversity hire? Um, you know, uh, what do you mean by that? Why is that significant for you? Um, it's, you know, those, those are, those are good opportunities to do that. Um, and I feel like, you know, one of the things to think about with allyship, um, is that it's, the word ally doesn't sound active, but it's super active, um, which means that, you know, you're going to be doing stuff like that and asking questions. And um, even when uh, <laughs> you might not want to, and there's something that you feel like you should be doing instead, like everybody has deadlines. Um, so, you know, it means that you're never really done. Like it's not a job that you get to finish. Um, so, yeah, I guess I just wanted to, to bring that up about that idea of allyship, that it's not sort of a thing that you do every once in a while. It just kind of is always there, particularly Great. when you might want to be doing something else. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Agreed. Agreed. <laughs> so, so let's, um, a couple more questions. And Katie, I think anytime you want to jump in with questions from the, from the group at large, you know, feel free. Um, so, um, how 
what advice can you give to well-meaning coworkers who might inadvertently perpetrate microaggressions? Hmm. What kind of advice would you give them? How do you how do you stop doing that? Well, I mean, I can I start with the idea of like somebody being well-intentioned? Um, sure. I mean, I think that I think that a lot of us, I mean, I've certainly, you know, had a lot of conversations about sort of assuming good intent from everyone that you work with, you know, those kind of team agreements that we all like have talked about in different ways over time. Um, and so you can assume that like everyone is to some degree or another well-intentioned, but I also feel like it's important to say that like in this case, intentions don't actually matter. Um, what matters more is the impact of what they're saying. Um, you know, and so if you're thinking about um, if you're thinking about sort of culture and people's c contribution to workplace culture as a kind of performance issue, um, then, you know, the intent doesn't necessarily matter so much. Um, you know, so in that case, if you can, um, if you're able to have conversations about, um, about this kind of stuff as, you know, as a, like, as it relates to performance, as it relates to, um, you know, team building as it relates to all of these other things, um, that might be more helpful than, um, you know, being concerned with not wanting to, um, I guess, hurt somebody's feelings because they're really a good person, if that makes sense. I guess I'm just, I, I don't necessarily want to center the intentions of the person who said the thing. What's ultimately more important is the impact, particularly when the impact is repeated and there's a pattern. Um, cause then you might be dealing with somebody who, you know, quits or a bunch of people who quit and that's a bigger institutional problem. Right. Right. Yeah. Right. Phyllis, any, any advice? Just mega dittos. Yeah. And just focus on <laughs> like, you know, yeah. Hey, you know, just that, that one thing that you do, uh, could you stop? Like, especially if you're a supervisor, I know we're going to get to that, but you know, if it's someone who's like, oh, I don't mean anything, you know, I'm just getting around as a supervisor, if you are, when you have power, you know, um, yeah. and if, if you don't have that power or don't feel that power, um, um, you know, I know that, that like kind of the square advice is always like, you know, talk to HR, talk to your supervisor. Like, I understand you can't always do that either. Yeah. And so I feel like there are subtle um, micro things you can do to protect yourself. So you can just figure out what you feel comfortable with as far as communicating that you're not the audience for that stuff. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, process it you know, with your friends. And so it's like, it's kind of in a way like turning their own thing back against them. But, um, you know, you can, it's, you know, like walk away. Um, you can, you know, like communicate with your face, like that wasn't cool or just be like, mm -hmm. anyway, you know, it's, but it's, you know, things like that, that you feel safe doing, that's something you can do. And then if it escalates, you might have to change tactics, but it's something that can at least like shut it down. I mean, you know, we all have the headphones in our office, right? Put oh man, headphones on. closing the office door, put the headphones yeah. on. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's sometimes that's what we have. And that's real. That's something you can use at least in the moment. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's a really good point. Actually, there are all kinds of cues you can give somebody. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Um, Katie, did you have something? I Yeah. Um, well, we had a question from the audience specifically kind of about the repeat offenders topic that we've been on. Um, what do you do when someone apologizes for the behavior, you know, and then continues to commit the same offense again and again? Mm, yeah. What happens a, if they're really sorry? Mm -hmm, that's a classic abuse pattern, right? And, and I think like it does come back to like, you know, just like focusing on yourself for a minute, what are you comfortable with? You know, I think that it can be a really good time to start writing things down. Yep. Because when the person starts apologizing and keeping doing it, that's kind of them letting you know, I'm gonna keep doing it. Mm -hmm. And maybe the only thing that escalates is their, the tenor and tone of their apology. And so you write down what happened, when, who saw it, where, what happened after that, you know, even if it's just a record you're keeping for yourself, I guarantee you, if this thing escalates to the point that managers are interested and start caring about it, that record will come in very handy for them. Yes, absolutely. I 100% agree with that. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, like, 
documenting creates more work for you. <laughs> um, but it's, um, I can speak from personal experience, unfortunately, that um, it can be extraordinarily, it can be very helpful. Um, it can be very powerful um, because, you know, I'm seeing a question here about gaslighting mm -hmm. and those patterns. Um, if you have, if you're documenting every instance of that, that is kind of an amazing elixir against being gaslit. You know that you're not making this up because yep. you have the record there yourself. Yep. Um, and you have something if you yourself need to escalate this somewhere else. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if, if, um, if you're in a position where you're supervising the person who has apologized, um, you know, I've, I've been in a situation where there was someone who would sort of say something in a group meeting and then apologize later in a group meeting and then say something again in a group meeting and then apologize in a group meeting um you know then <laughs> then it's sort of on you to um to point out that it, that that person's apology is coming across as um as false mm -hmm. because they're cont they're not they haven't learned from the behavior they haven't changed the behavior mm -hmm. um so, you know, that's a fair, that's also a fair performance conversation to have. Um, it's not dissimilar from like, you know, um, not learning how to audit, uh, edit audio <laughs> and then apologizing for that and then continuing not to learn and then apologizing and then continuing not to learn. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and something that I learned at one of my jobs too, if you do have to get into this documentation thing, something that can really help you is to email it to yourself. <laughs> Email it from your work account to your work account. If you need yep. to keep it somewhere else, also do that. Yeah. But that shows not that, I mean, it would be a ridiculous um, thing to come up, but that shows that you're not making it up ma months after the fact. Yeah. So it stinks. But if it gets to that point where these are things are micro or micro or micro happening over and over and over and over again, that's something you have at your disposal too, is when, when you have your little description of it, email yeah. it to yourself, even if it's a couple of days later. Yep. Great, great conversation. Um, so do either of you have any instances where you've seen someone else deal with microaggressions in a way that taught you something? Hmm. Yes, I've seen Phyllis. <laughs> when she, I have actually. Uh, the example Phyllis gave of, of documentation um, was, you know, that was something that she suggested to me actually um, years ago, and uh, it was extraordinarily helpful as I as I talked about before. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Aww. For, for, That's great. Yep. It's true. <laughs> <laughs> and to me, anyone who keeps their composure and doesn't feel like it's their fault like that's a hero to me so um you know i admire people who can do that that's a great one we had a follow-up yeah. question about documentation um so it's kind of like worst case scenario what happens if you've reported microaggressions to your supervisor and even their supervisors but nothing happens even after documentation yeah yeah that happens a lot it does um i mean i guess this is not going to be a satisfying answer, but at least you know a little bit more about the culture of the institution you're working in uh, than you did before. Because before you, you brought it to the attention of supervisors up the chain, you didn't know what the response was going to be. And now you do. So you might be able to make some more informed decisions about whether you want to continue your job there, whether you want to continue your career there or look elsewhere. Um, like I said, not super satisfying, but at least you know something you didn't know before about where you work. Mm -hmm. And it could, you know, maybe it motivates you to be like, you know what, I want to be a supervisor. Like, you know, I mean, yeah. and it doesn't mean you have to supervise there. Maybe you could, but, um, <laughs> you know, it's, it's something that it can give you an opportunity to look at what your options are. Because, yeah, it's a drag. That's a yeah, drag. it is. Yeah. And I think it's important to, you know, every person has their own level of comfort with, with all of this yep. and, and, you know, something that you might be uncomfortable with or, you know, something you might be comfortable with, other people may be completely uncomfortable. Yeah. yeah. And so, you know, I, I mean, you have to decide your own level of comfort and, mm -hmm. and again, not a satisfying answer, but sometimes the answer is leave. 
<laughs> I mean, it's, right. it's, right. it's not a good answer. Right. And, or see if you can switch teams, you know, get a, maybe there are other people you can work with in the same place. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. and, you know, bad supervision just, uh, you know, is bad supervision. You know, if, if yeah. people, if, if it's going that far, then obviously you have some supervisory issues in your organization. Mm -hmm. Yes. Because no one should be okay with, anyone in their organization being uncomfortable in their workplace. Yes. No. <laughs> and by doing professional development things like this webinar and anything that you can get to increase your personal power and influence in the workplace will be good, you know, for your career for all kinds of ways. So whether yeah. that's, you know, doing some Jill Geisler stuff, some pointer stuff, if there's some like supervisory classes that you can take in town, whether they're involved in media stuff or not. Um, I've, I've found all of those things really helpful because it's also, it just gives you more, more um, angles, uh, ways to look at your situation and more opportunities for you too. Mm. Yeah. And, and, you know, we've mentioned Jill Geisler a number of times, but I have to yeah. say that, that she, <laughs> she is truly one of my heroes when it comes to all of this, because if you've ever watched her work, she is so expert at, at, not making people feel like they've done something wrong, yeah. but still being able to redirect the conversation in a more positive manner. And yeah. it's an amazing skill that I have not managed to, <laughs> you know, I mean, I'm not that good at it. She's amazing at it. She's she incredible. can, you know, and, and so she is the one that when I think about who have I seen do something and she, she just is so good at sort of turning the conversation to a positive, but never making anyone feel like they were put upon or did something wrong. Yeah. And it's, it's an amazing skill. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. yeah. Cause also it's important to know that that's not for you to fix. Like mm. how wrong that person is, you know, yeah. you fix like it might make your life better if they did like personal work on themselves, <laughs> like, fix that stuff. But um, it is not for you to fix. Yep. So there's just certain behaviors that you don't want happening around you anymore. It doesn't mean you can or have to try to fix them as a person. And I think that that's another thing that Jill really is good at separating out. And I recommend reading, you know, anything she's written or watching any webinar she's done. She's, uh, she's great. Uh, wear your feedback glasses. Look for that one. <laughs> well, that's a good a, one. Jill Geisler. Question. There's a question kind of along those lines uh, from the audience too, when you said it's kind of not your job to fix bad behavior or bad habits. Um, could you all maybe address uh, the perspective of the person who's creating the, a microaggression or like, tends mm -hmm. to kind of like have those behaviors and you know what it might look like from their perspective? Mm -hmm. This person says they've encountered a lot of people that don't recognize what yeah. they're doing to be a microaggression. I think we don't like to think that we don't recognize it either. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. Um, you know, I think, you know, one of the things I'm, th I'm, I'm thinking of, I'm having a weird moment where I'm thinking of people who I've worked with who I know did not recognize that they were doing this. And then I'm also like, I've been this person. Have I been this person? I've probably been this person. Um, you know, if you, I guess the first, the first thing you need to do is be open to the idea that like um that addressing um addressing your own behavior or at least interrogating your own behavior behavior again not because like not because you're like a bad person or you're doing anything wrong to sort of channel what you were talking about with Jill Geisler but like um you know the fact that it that that it can only lead to sort of an overall better um performance environment for where you're working um the first, the first thing to do is to take seriously any feedback you get from other people, uh, verbal and nonverbal, because, you know, as Phyllis rightly pointed out, you know, you might be in a position where people don't want to tell you directly what's going on, um, but they might show you what's going on, you know, by putting their headphones on whenever you walk in the room, um, you know, by uh, not interacting with you the way you see them interacting with other people, um, you know, by stiffening up when you make a joke to them. Um, those are important cues to pay attention to, um, to, you know, as, as a clue that maybe you need to start considering um, why somebody stiffened up when you made that joke. 
um, you know, why you didn't get the reaction you thought you were going to get because you thought it was a pretty funny thing to say. Um, you know, that's, that's, that's a place to start for sure. Um, I would also say that um, if you're supervising one of those people, I can remember two or three different instances where um, somebody who sort of was, a, I guess, a repeat microaggressor um, was shocked when they were finally called on it because they were like, I've been, I've been like this for years and nobody ever said anything. Um, so, you know, that I means that- That's an important distinction too, because I, yeah. think, I think sometimes people just don't know that they're doing it and are, and are surprised when th someone finally does say, yeah. hey, that might have not have been really the appropriate way to handle that. Right, right. Yeah. yeah, I mean, you know, I, I, I think I cheated because I turned it from the perspective of the, the microaggressor there. Um, but, you know, um, if, if, let's all assume, let's, let, let's just all assume that we are microaggressors, because we probably are. And, um, you know, we have been at some point. Um, and, and, you know, be more mindful of how people respond when we speak or how they respond when we walk into a room. Um, you know, that's, and that's, that's good information. From experience, from a time when I said something that someone found inappropriate and they called me on it, that, that it really does make you think about what you're saying in a way that you wouldn't have if they hadn't brought it up. Yeah. So, so as, as often as we say, you know, it's really hard to bring these things up and it is, but, but sometimes you can really make a difference if you do. Yeah. Because, you know, I, again, from experience, someone brought something to my attention and I thought, oh my gosh, I never would have, I, I, even after it was brought to my attention, it was like, oh my God, I can't, I didn't know that would be offensive to someone. Yeah. And so, and so, you know, when that happens, it makes you look at other things and, you know, I mean, yeah. learning learning opportunities, Phyllis, you know, I, I think I'm a lot more aware after I took the workplace integrity, train the trainers, after I've done some of these webinars, um, uh, I'm more aware of what I say and how I react to people. Yeah. Hey, Christine, can I ask you a question about that instance? Sure. Um, did you feel, how did you feel when that person called you out? Oh, did I was devastated. I mean, I was, I was, I was so embarrassed. Yeah. Um, and, and, and again, it was, it was something I said that I never would have thought would offend anyone. And so when someone brought it to my attention, I thought, oh, it was never my intention to offend anyone, you know? So yeah. it was, um, I was very embarrassed. Um, and, and I will never forget it. Yeah. Right? And, and the person who pro brought this to me probably has no recollection of this conversation ever having <laughs> happening and I will never forget it. Yeah. Well, thanks for answering that, honestly. Um, I asked because I think that probably anybody who has been called out or called in or confronted or, you know, if somebody has said to them, hey, you said this thing, uh, we need to talk about the thing you said, um, has a, has a re reaction of feeling embarrassed or defensive or whatever it is. Like, that's totally normal to feel that way. The next thing to do is get through that just accept that you feel it and move through it <laughs> and, and focus on like, you know, okay, so, so what can I do? Um, what can I do to, uh, to improve here? Um, and, the, and the, the goal isn't to be embarrassed. The goal isn't right. to feel terrible. The goal is to recognize that and then learn from it. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think absolutely. And I also think if it's a specific, if, if, if the person who's pointing it out to you says, you know, X person was offended by this. I mean, had that been the message, I would have gone to X person and said, I am very sorry. It was never my intention. Um, but if it's more general, it's yeah. it sort of don't have as much. It's like, what do I do with that information now? <laughs> now that it's already past me, you know, and I think the answer is you just are more aware the next time you speak, when you open your mouth, you think about what you're saying. Yeah. 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 And as hard as it is, like, that's an opportunity. Somebody was brave enough to say something to you. That's an opportunity to yes. learn. 
Yes, exactly. you know, and opportunities to learn are not always fun, but they are <laughs> opportunities. No, they are not. They are not. We did receive a comment, though, that, you know, doing the work of calling people out is also, you know, not fun <laughs> on the flip side as well. Um, someone no. said that they find it incredibly important to call things out in a thoughtful way and that they work hard to do it because, like we've been talking about, sometimes people just don't realize what they're saying or, like, why it might be problematic. Um, but it's also exhausting to continually do that. So it's just like you know, doing the yes. work either way is, is hard more than what's in our job description for sure. And that's um, why I really loved Phyllis's suggestion of saying to that person, you know, that really didn't seem like you. Yep. It, it's, it's less uncomfortable. It's less, you know, sort of in your face. And, and I think an, a great, a great way to sort of address that. I agree. Yeah. Um, we have a few um, questions that are just kind of like general advice or like, like just kind of like different, different questions asking for advice. Um, so I might uh, toss a couple of those over now. Um, the first one is uh, one that hit like pretty closely to me too. I think like this is a pretty uh, relatable topic for a lot of people that have called in. Um, but the issue uh, of microaggressions just generally feels like it's pervasive and it's not just case by case, but it's really a problem that we have across our industry. Um, so do you all have any advice for somebody who wants to really thrive in public media, but is struggling just with not being discouraged? Hmm. Yeah, I, I think, you know, connecting with people whose work you admire, whether it's in your organization or outside, um, and whether it's in public media or not, or even if it's in journalism or not, yeah. um, you know, and, and, you know, just like seeing if you can do whether you want to call it informational interviews or just like following them on Twitter and developing a relationship that way, or, you know, going to seminars and things like that to really get your, get your um, validation and also your inspiration outside of the workplace yeah um and to really like develop a trajectory for what you want your career to be and and follow that regardless of what people around you are doing um and that can sometimes that's awesome and sometimes that's really really hard yeah. um but that that way you're minimizing the importance and impact and effect of the people who have the power to influence you in the workplace um, if that influence is negative um, you know and ideally then by doing that you build upon that and you know get yourself more and more opportunities that way and like I said sometimes easier sometimes harder but yeah. in general that would be my overarching advice for that yeah that's great advice that's I think so too that's so good I, be, I mean it's it can be very easy to forget that a lot of us get into this particular um, field because, you know, we loved somebody else's work. Um, you know, we grew up listening to it. Um, and staying in touch with that piece of it can be really, really helpful. Um, that's, that's great, great advice, Phyllis. Um, and I think less satisfying again. Um, but, but, uh, you know, I have been, I've been in public media. I've been in lots of different, different, organizations and different fields and and it's not just public media it's not yeah. i mean these are these things are prevalent kind oh, of yeah. everywhere yeah yeah so your yeah, oasis sure. is your home <laughs> yes <laughs> which you know hopefully you know yeah. uh, especially right now because oh my god yeah we're blurring those lines right even right now by yes. all being here from you know remote places but um you know it's it's it it can be it can be a hard transition um you know but to really really um you know split things up that way and yeah and get your inspiration from from other places yeah i was gonna say something similar actually um one of the things that i you know that i have struggled with personally and i've seen other people struggle with particularly in public media is the blurring of our identities and our personhood with our jobs yeah um and you know what, you can love the mission of public media, but you are not your job. Um, and, um, you know, that means that nobody has, there is, you know, <laughs> that everybody is the Wicked Witch of the West. They might have power <laughs> in some places, but they don't have power everywhere. Right. Um, so um, it's like, I'm like, 
look, I'm 45 years old. I have literally just figured this out. So like, <laughs> um, but it's an important thing to remember, um, especially in times like this, right? When there's one story that many of us are chasing, um, but we're not our jobs. Um, and so, you know, being mindful of that as well can, and, and finding ways to sort of take care of the, the you that exists outside your job is, is really important as, you know, yeah. as Oprah, as that might sound, I think that's really true. <laughs> yeah, very much. Yeah. Very true. Mm -hmm. I have some more questions from the audience here. Um, next one is also just kind of seeking some advice. I'd love to hear your thoughts or advice on issues facing particularly young women in the workplace. As a 24-year-old energized and innovative young professional, I find many of my older male colleagues brushing off, pushing against, or being blatantly disrespectful of my ideas and opinions. I have high aspirations and won't stop trying to make a positive change, but how can I fight the stereotypes of being a green young girl who doesn't mm. have the experience to speak with authority? Ugh, gross. Continue oh, to show your expertise. Continue to... Yep. Do the work and do it well. I mean, yeah. unfortunately, time and, you know, I mean, just keep doing good work, I think, is so important. And, and you know, if you keep doing good work, people will see it. Maybe not yep. every person, but people will see it. I find yeah. that very true. Yeah, I second that. And so sometimes that means, um, you know, like, just getting on a newscast even, um, you know, like if you can um, pitch to the newscast desk, which can be its own intimidating process. <laughs> I'm very aware um, from many angles on that. It can be intimidating. <laughs> Sometimes your bureau chief can help you out with that. Um, so, um, you know, pitching to the newscast desk, um, you know, like um, finding ways to get your work out there outside of the system of of your specific office. Yeah. Um, because what will show those people is when other people recognize. And a couple of things happen when that happens. You realize that yes, it can be good for your career when other people start recognizing, but it also can make you realize it's not that important to me personally, whether these people get it or not. Like it will make things easier in your life. And, you know, like, and those things do intertwine and, you know, with each other, but you'll realize that like, it didn't matter all along what, whether those people got it, like they'll get it. It's just that probably it'll be other people convincing them because everyone will be like, damn, look what she did, you know, yeah. have to recognize. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you find those places and pick your spots where you can make a difference. And, you know, I mean, the cool thing is it, with, you know, like it can be unmediated, like you can develop your own expertise on Twitter and just, you know, like build up a Twitter following and what you're, you know, I know it's like easier said than done. Oh, just build up a Twitter following. But it's like, <laughs> if you start like having threads on things that are important to you, they can be very specific and niche, true. but other people who will find those things, um, yep. you know, and like you can get your photography out there and everything that way. So it's like you pick what you're compelled by and get it out there by any means necessary. Yes. And then people will, people will eventually get it, even if it takes them years. Yes. I'm also going to just hazard a guess about those those older dudes who are being very dismissive. They're a little scared of you. Um, they're the likelihood that they're going to be around as long as you are is real slim. Mm -hmm. And uh, the likelihood that you might be their boss someday, maybe high. Um, so you know if if they're that kind of repeated dismissiveness uh, tells you a lot. This is again another place where you're like getting information that you didn't have before that's giving you a lot of information about who those people are um mm -hmm. and uh that they <laughs> they see something in you and that makes them uncomfortable um and that is not your fault and it's it might be something you have to work around for the time being but not forever not forever I also think that Phyllis's earlier advice about finding people that you admire and people that are in, you know, that you like their work, whether it's within your organization or outside of your organization, 
having mentors, having allies. I think those are all really important things as you're yes. moving through your career and, and for all levels of your career, whether you're 24 or 54, it doesn't matter. Yes. A hundred percent. We have another question about men. <laughs> uh, <laughs> frankly, um, this webinar does not pass the Bechdel test, <laughs> but I get why. <laughs> I get why. <laughs> yeah. What is what is the best way to advocate for a colleague who's constantly being mansplained to? Ah. <laughs> Good Lord. Um, yeah. I mean, oh boy. So. This depends on your own comfort level and when you want to advocate. Um, you know, if you are, if you are witnessing the mansplaining in real time, uh, you can choose to, um, assuming you've already had a conversation with the person who's being mansplained to, and she's like, yeah, it's ridiculous. It's driving me crazy. I would love it if somebody would like step up and help me out here. Um, check in with her experience on it first. Um, but you know, if, if she is okay with it, you can interrupt it. <laughs> um, you can literally interrupt it um, with questions. Uh, you know, why do you why do you keep explaining how editing works to Phyllis? Um, <laughs> she's been an editor for more than a decade. Um, have you Googled you know. her? Um, you know, uh, that might be a little sarcastic, but you know, you can you can interrupt in the moment. You can choose to have a conversation with the man the mansplainer later. Um, you know, I don't know if you know this about Phyllis, but actually, um, you know, she's, she's an expert in kites. Maybe you should, you know, she has like an advanced degree from Columbia about kites and how to build them. So maybe you should, you know, maybe you should ask her questions if you want to know more about kites rather than assuming you know more because she could be a really great resource. Um, those are a couple of different options that you have, assuming you've already sort of, you know, taken Phyllis's great advice from earlier and, um, you know, talk to the person who's having that experience and seeing that, making sure that she would be comfortable with, with uh, an intervention. And I would and just like to point out that oh, mansplaining yeah. is not only done by men. Oh, right? Right. oh hell no. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <For sure. laughs> yeah, and you can also, um, you know, wait for it to happen to you and say something then because it sounds like this person might be an equal opportunity like you know here's everything I know about everything and you know and it's funny too because it's like um you know uh sometimes yeah it's I mean there are so many different contexts in which people do that like you yeah. know when it's done in a professional context it is very 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 frustrating like sometimes people it's like it turns out they're trying to connect and I think you do find out when you mm. when you interrupt it and ask questions be like bro you know we've talked about this like what what are we doing here you know and if he's like oh well I just wanted to say blah blah you know then like you can jump in with your own story if you want it just yeah, yeah it depends what it is that's a good point yeah and, it's um yeah and I'm just gonna go I'm just gonna back up a second and say you know I I'm not very good at this either I am not very good at confronting someone who is microaggressing against me. So, so don't, don't make, you know, don't think that every, that just because we're here, we're great at this. I am not that good at this. I, you know, I frequently let things roll that sometimes maybe I should address. So you're not alone if yeah. that's your, if that's your case. No. Yeah. Not yeah. And there's no like perfect solution here. Yeah. yeah, there's not like a Fonzie hits the box <laughs> moment. Like, hey. the <laughs> Thank you for that. Uh, yeah. That's great. <laughs> this might be this next one might be one of our, our last questions, but okay. it's like so infuriating that everyone that's working on this webinar is like enraged. So oh um, buckle up. Um, my male GM recently yelled at my female boss in a meeting with all her subordinates and told her to suck it up and put her big girl pants on. No! I was too shocked to say anything, but when I followed up to check on my boss, she dismissed the incident. What would you do? Oh my Dude, god. That is so uncool. That so, is unbelievable. Yeah, that's, that's <sighs> wild. Um, so, I mean... My first my first question here would be, is there an HR department in this organization? And if so, let's be talking to them. Mm. Right. Um, yeah. That's inappropriate behavior, no matter 
where you are frankly yeah that's, that's yeah. ridiculous i mean you know i so like there's there is research boy i have a oh okay so <laughs> one i'm wondering if there is a pattern here with this gm yelling at his subordinates in meetings in public spaces uh in front of other people or if this is the first time this has happened um two there's research that shows that if you are a witness to someone being yelled at in a situation like that, you have a similar response to the person that the yelling is directed at, right? Like it's sort of, um, you know, it, it negatively affects everyone, um, whether you're a witness or the person it's aimed at. So um, if you're going to talk to HR um, and gosh, you just, you never know what, if HR is going to, be helpful or not but um they just responded uh, and in this specific case uh yeah. my female boss is also the hr rep to our university oh, uh, <laughs> and she's saying to not do anything man that is whack well one thing i have learned is that um there can be a huge like deliberate bifurcation between hr operations of your de department being your radio station your yeah. licensee and your university and yes. um sometimes True. hr proceedings don't count if they weren't happening at the university level and your hr rep probably knows that and she probably is feeling like very very unsure i'm just i'm guessing i'm reading a lot of tea leaves here like she's yeah. feeling unsure of what would happen if she did escalate um yeah and i i can understand that that ha happens a lot um and um, I think that one thing I would definitely do is write everything down mm -hmm. and email it to myself and including like the date, the time, the names of all the people who were there. And, um, and I would look at what my options were. Um, you know, do I feel like I want to get everybody together or even just on my own, like write an anonymous like paper note and stick it in the GM's box and be like, dude, that wasn't cool. Yeah you know or yeah you know because it's like i like to think about what is my goal in this is my goal to have it never happen again um is my goal to see what i can to um to do to like have some sort of major personnel change there like what is my goal and then strategize around that and probably i'm guessing the goal is to just not have it happen again right and i would hope that someone getting an anonymous note in their box with like I you know like this wasn't cool um you know I wrote down everything that happened um I didn't like it um and I'm saving that for a rainy day so I don't want to see this again like it sounds bold but you know it's an anonymous note I'm yeah I'm gonna know it was you so yeah that would be something you could try if if you just absolutely don't want that to happen again yeah I mean another thing that you might have um you know I know like you know, KUOW is a, is a licensee of the University of Washington, and there are resources available to me at the university level that are not available to me solely as an employee of KUOW, like an ombuds office, for example. Um, you know, and so there might be places you can go outside of your station that is part of the university where you can have a conversation about what happened and what options you have should this continue. Um, that's what the ombuds office at the University of Washington does is um, it is a confidential discussion and y they tell you about your options. Yeah. Like um, here are things you can do if you want to. And yeah. just doing that can be very helpful. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Sorry that happened. That's, yeah. That's Holy crap. Up. That's that not okay. Wild. That's, no. that's not no. the most uplifting note to, to no. wrap up on. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Um, but we are at time here, so I just have like a little bit of housekeeping uh, and we can wrap up for the day. Uh, thank you so much to our amazing panelists and to your audience for joining us in this candid conversation that went beyond our typical hour to an hour and 15. Like, thank you everybody for staying on board. <laughs> this has been amazing. Um, be sure to visit our website, publicmediawomenandleadership.org to find out what's in store for 2020 for our advanced webinar series and to learn more about our empowering public media initiative. And as always, we'll be posting a recording of this webinar to our website. So thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank thanks. you. I enjoyed it. Thank you so much.